Raps pumped up message to them is to get naked and shake it before giving it up to do the wild thing, he says. And many will do just that, bearing another generation of doomed innocents who despise the evil done them grow up to be responsible for their own acts. Of course, white kids listen to this music and see these videos too, including kids who will grow up to be corporate American bosses, and it affects the way they see black people, William says. They will come away with an image of black women as indis indiscriminate sluts and black men, as African American journalist Stanley Crouch puts it, as monkey moving, gold chain wearing, illiteracy, spouting, penis pulling, sullens, combative buffoons. Who would hire such a person? Williams asked. Who would want to live next to them? This $4 billion a year industry in which blacks are the performers, the designers, and many of the executives presents African Americans to the entire world in terms the Ku Klux Klan would use. Where are the civil rights leaders? Williams Rogue's gallery includes, besides the stuck in the 60s civil rights poopas, the racketeering reverends, the corporate pose, and the explorative rappers, also the nutty black studies professors. A typical specimen, Georgetown professor Michael Eric Dyson leaped into the Cosby debate in 2005 with, is Bill Cosby right or has the black middle class lost his mind? Dyson's attack just the old victimology with a 21st century twist usefully underscores how specious and destructive that orthodoxy is. It also calls into question the academy's push for the black perspective on its facilities when that, when that perspective is by definition the harmful one of victimhood and grievance. Cosby's blaming of the poor, Dyson says, is the traditional attitude of an African American elite fatally obsessed with white approval and persuaded that an embrace of Victorian values will win acceptance from the white majority. But the pathologies of the poor subvert their efforts, ruining the reputation of the race. And so, beginning long ago, the black aristocracy began. A program of moral rebuke disguised as social uplift like Cosby. They police poor black communities from the lecture, trying to impose on them temperance, thrift, refined manners, and Victorian sexual morals. But they were wrong to think that if only the poor were willing to work harder, act better, get educated, stay out of jail, and parent more effectively, their problems would go away. It is not the personal behavior of the black poor, but American society's structural barriers, including the export of jobs and ongoing racial stigma that prevent blacks from rising. Similar structural barriers hold black kids back educationally, while the suburbs boast $60 million schools with state-of-the-art technology. Inner city schools fight desperately for funding, ensuring that our children will continue to spiral down stairwells of suffering and oppression. Even black crime has a structural component. Since society has consided the black poor to conditions that offer them limited options, which often, yes, lead to poor choices, so that society is partly to blame. Moreover, the war on drugs is a war on black and brown people and innovations in policing measures leading eventually to racial profiling, greatly increased the odds that blacks would do serious time for nonviolence and often first-time offenses. Assertions with an untruth in almost every word. But white America has a reason for its war on minorities. The prison industrial complex literally provides white economic opportunity across class strata, Dyson explains. Big money is at stake when it comes to making the crucial choice to support blacks at the state university, or the state penitentiary. Cosby calls for personal responsibility is thus doubtly cruel. It asks the black poor to feel undeserved blame for their own victimization, while excusing whites from coming to their rescue. Dyson spurs up the old style victimology with a dash of hip multicultural relativism in thinking he has achieved a universal humanity beyond race because the virtues he embodies are supposedly universal. Cosby has made an error that most whites and many blacks, thanks to white dominance makes, says Dyson, that white identity is normative and hence universal. But for black people to aspire to that identity requires unhealthy doses of self-abnegation and conscious rejection of the identity they have inherited or invented. Much better, says Dyson, for black people to keep it real, which often means honoring the ghetto roots of black identity. African-Americans should value 
the elements of mass co black culture that enable black folks to resist oppression, transcend their suffering, and transform their pain. Hence, Cosby is wrong to reject the black English, which grows out of the fierce linguistility of black existence. The insistence by blacks of craving a speech of their own and to scoff at supposedly African names like Shaquita, Shanguela, Muhammad. Though such names may be African, only in that they reflected flair and creativity, Dyson says. The important thing is that they recall the freedom to name themselves, that blacks asserted under slavery, refusing to tie their identities to names their owners gave them. Cosby is at his most wrong, though, Dyson says, in his hatred of rap, which expresses the authentically black gangster belief that the lifestyle and ideology of the outlaw, the rebel, and the bandit challenge the corrupt norms of the state, the government, and the rules of law and society. So, too, with hip-hop fashion, with his hat on backward, pants down around the crack that Cosby deployed in his speech, fashion in black urban circles rise to performing arts, Dyson tells us. The more daring their fashions, the less cooperative they are with bourgeois elegance, and the more they undermine bland conformatism, the more likely black youths are to understand their bodies as battlefields of fierce moral contests. Do their pants hang low? This may be understood as sympathy dress, an over-identification with relatives who may have been caught up in the bloody urban drama. It is a way of reclaiming the body of a loved one from his demoralized confinement and grant Nick vicariously the freedom to walk to walk on the streets from which it has been removed and in truth many black youth who wear baggy pants may feel they are already in prison at least one of perception built by the white mainstream and by their dismissive demeaning elders thus does the idle sophistry of armchair elites come to ratify culture patterns once recognized as fatal to the poor the debate raging throughout black america is the most historic because it is also raging within the soul of America's first black presidential nominee. Which Obama will prevail? The old orthodoxy Obama who sat for 20 years listening to Reverend Wright saying goddamn America and claiming that the government purposely infected the ghetto with AIDS who brought his daughters to hear him and who named a book after one of his sermons? The Obama whose wife and her grievances and resentments, her whine that Africa is just downright mean and uncannily embodies the black bourgeois attitudes that Elise Koss described 15 years ago as the rage of a privileged class? Or will it be the Obama who will truly usher in the age of post-radical politics as he seemed to promise when he first emerged as so fresh and attractive a candidate? The Obama who marked Father's Day with a moving speech on black American need for responsible fathers that Bill Cosby would cheer? At the very least, his nomination, as he himself has said, shows how much progress black America has made. Let's hope the African-American majority will take the lesson to heart.